So the big question is, how do entrepreneurs like us, who built our businesses from the ground up, who spend our own capital, who wanna make a huge impact on this world while creating a great income? Those are the questions we will answer in this podcast. My name is David Asarno, and welcome to Get Naked in Business. I'm glad you're here. Now it's time to get naked. What can we learn from a failed teenage drug dealer? Yes, that's what today's episode is about. My guest is Eric Frank. Not only is he my business coach, but he's built several eight-figure businesses from those mistakes that he made as a kid, and he's gonna share them all with us today. Welcome to another episode of Get Naked in Business. This is David Asarno, and I am so excited for today's guest, and here's why. Everybody needs a coach, and today, we are going to be speaking with my coach, Eric Frank. Welcome to Get Naked in Business, Eric. Thank you, David. Thank you for having me. So, I want to ask you, this is about getting real, it's about getting raw, and it's about getting truthful, because the only way that we're able to really accelerate ourselves is to strip down naked, get in front of the mirror, jump up and down and see everything. Now, when was the first time that you actually realized that you were an entrepreneur? That's a great question and something I don't share with a lot of people, but it was in the seventh grade and it was the first day that I sold weed. So you're a drug dealer? I was an attempted drug dealer. Tell you about my drug dealing career. Um, I smoked weed for the first time. It was expensive. I said, boy, there's got to be a better way where I can get this for free. I said, I'm going to buy a bunch and I'm going to sell it. Uh, My parents heard me talking about it. They came up into my room, tore my room apart, found it all, and confiscated it. So I'm not really a drug dealer. I was a failed drug dealer. So so your first entrepreneurial experience ever, you just crashed and burned and you failed. How much did you invest to to, to try to do that? I I was investing 60 whole dollars. And my my plan, I was going to turn that 60 into a whopping 120. Okay, you were gonna double it, so that's you know that's pretty good return on investment. Yeah, yeah. and uh, I made one sale um, to my best friend, and then I, my whole organization and my crime ring was uh, caved yeah. in on me. So, so what, what, what was your experience and learning lesson besides how long were you grounded? <laughs> I was grounded for a year. Um, <laughs> wait, wait. So you were grounded the whole seventh grade. I was gra- uh, so this was the end of seventh grade, okay. and I was grounded through the end of seventh grade through the summer. Which as a kid, you lose your summer, right? Yeah. That's like losing. That's like ten years. Um, and then for the eight, beginning of the eighth grade, I was allowed to um, reemerge and come back and see my friends. So, so where did you go from there? Obviously, you wanted money for you wanted to, for some reason, right? So I was a big tennis player at the time, and I had a tennis coach. And um, what he said is, look, I will train you to be a coach and you start coaching the little kids, you know, the six and seven year olds that I don't really want to deal with. And so that's when I realized that was my first entree into coaching was teaching little kids tennis, um, which I loved. And uh, I did that for a few years and then I became a personal trainer um, because I loved fitness. I moved into the gym and I started working as a personal trainer. And um, that's really how I built my sales skills because I was just selling myself and my services. Um, and it really escalated from there. Okay, and you did that throughout college? I was a personal trainer um, at the New Orleans Athletic Club from, for about 10 years through college. Yeah. And um, then that transitioned into my first real business. So a gentleman by the name of Barack Obama was elected president. Um, soon after that, healthcare reform came around. And what, what were businesses thinking back then when the healthcare oh reform? Oh my God, so I trained a lot of wealthy clients that owned businesses and they were like, oh, this is gonna ruin my business, I'm gonna have to fire everybody, how can I ever afford to pay health insurance to all these people? So I saw a big problem, and I said, I'm gonna learn as much as I can about this, so I got certified in healthcare reform as it pertained to corporate wellness, and I was the first class in Washington, D.C. to get certified, and then I just started marketing my services, I can come build you a corporate wellness program, and at the time, it was like the Wild West, right? Nobody knew anything about corporate wellness, so we were putting in programs for large organizations, Coke and Pepsi, and we worked with Humana, um, implementing corporate wellness programs to help executives and mid-level managers get healthy in the beginning. Now, I wanna talk about the psychology of success. We'll go back to where you went from there. There's a difference I see between someone who says that they want to become an entrepreneur and those who actually do, because it's not a straight up road as you know, and we'll talk a little bit about that. But you, the, the psychology, you were a, a high level tennis player. 
and then you got into powerlifting, right? You sort of won something in that. Yeah. So 2010, I won the American Powerlifting National Championship. So I was the strongest person in the in the country. But that's not really. And the, by the way, he's got a really good handshake. <laughs> but that's not real. Let's test it. Let's test. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, uh, but that's not really the story. So the first powerlifting meet I ever did was in 2005. Yes. Um, I actually got third place in the meet, which sounds pretty good until you realize that there was only three people in my weight class. So I <laughs> so I got last. Um, and I was doing the meet, and before uh, before the meet, my coach came up to me and he said, he said, are you scared? And I said, yeah, yeah, I'm scared. He said, great. He said, if you aren't scared, it ain't big enough. He said, if you ain't scared, it ain't big enough. And I said, great, Dexter, because I am petrified. I am, I am worried I'm gonna wet myself out on the platform. <laughs> so uh, it was my third squat. I made my first two. So powerlifting is three squats, three deadlifts, three bench presses. Um, on my third squat, I went for a weight that was 50 pounds too heavy. I thought I was gonna get magic pixie dust and somehow magically do 50 pounds more than I've ever done. Uh, I go all the way down for the squat. I go to come up, it's way too heavy. The bar bends me over in half. My feet flip over my head. We're on a stage, right? So I flip over my head on the foot of the stage and then I bounce down off the stage oh, four wow. feet below where all the judges are sitting and I land with a thud. And I just lay there and I'm like, you know what? If they all think I'm dead, nobody will laugh at me. And nobody laughed at me. And my team came running up to me and they grabbed me and they picked me up and they said, Frank, that was great. You got balls. And I was hooked on powerlifting <laughs> like that, right? Because failure is what, is what brought us all together. And they were proud of me because I tried right. something you, so you. much heavier than I really could do. So um, five years passes. I go from local meets to regional meets to I was invited to lift at the Arnold Classic all the time just in incremental improvements, incremental improvements, incremental improvements. And so 2010, five years later, I win the national championship. And so that, what that told me is in five years, I can accomplish anything. I can go from being the very worst in a local meet to being the very best in the country if I, if I set goals, if I, if I do the stuff I'm supposed to do, and if I just keep getting better a little bit every day. And I wanted to ask you that because so many times people hear all the successes that people have and they only focus in on what happened five years later, what happened 10 years later. Right. They don't look at the hard work that went into to doing it. So let's get back to healthcare reform. You, you become the first, one of the first certified in that first class. What kind of company did you start? So I started a corporate wellness consulting practice where what we would do is we would work with first executive teams and then mid-level managed teams on getting their groups healthier. Um, through exercise, through fitness tracking, that sort of thing. And um, we'd come in and we'd almost do exactly what I'm doing now in business coaching, but around the health side. Um, so we'd figure out everybody's goals, where are you today, where do you wanna go, and then put you on a program for a year and then monitor you every quarter to make sure that you're doing well. Um, and then reward- it's accountability. It, it's, it's accountability, I mean, it's, it's, here's the interesting thing. So there's no difference between coaching people in the gym and coaching people in business. It really comes down to three things disciplined thought, really thinking about where I am today and where I want to go. Disciplined planning, knowing exactly what I'm going to do every day to get for the next 90 days to get where I want to go. And then disciplined action, actually doing the stuff every day that I said I was going to do and then regroup and start again. Disciplined planning, disciplined thought, disciplined action. So you decided to get into manufacturing from there. Right. So let's talk about that. You, you saw that, okay, if I want to scale, I need to be able to do something a little bit differently. Where, right. where was your head at there? So the corporate wellness practice blew up, right? Which was the worst thing that could have ever happened to me, right? Well, it's the best and worst. Nope, it was the worst thing because it, it made my head get big. And I thought, it was, I thought I was being successful because of me. And that's not true. I was successful because I was the first one in and that it, it blew up, the, the market itself blew up for what we were doing. So people were calling me, my phones were ringing, we couldn't hire people fast enough to go put these programs in. Great problem to have. I thought that it was because of me, not because of timing and what we were doing. So it blew up and I realized this wasn't that scalable because it required people. I had to keep hiring people, I had to grow the organization. And I said, and this isn't even the real problem, right? The real problem is the food that these are people are eating at work, not the activity. So we were in Fitbits, 
tracking people's steps, well that makes up 10% of your health. The real problem is the food people were putting in their mouths. That's 60% of your health. And I said, Entrepreneur Eric, he's the guy to fix it, right? So I, I started a food manufacturing and distribution business. I had no manufacturing experience, I had no distribution experience. So I had sold the corporate wellness company, I sunk all the money from that sale into this business, and I raised money, about a million dollars, and I managed to lose it within a year. So what does every good entrepreneur do? He raises more money, right? Because I said, we, there's still a problem, we still gotta solve it, I raised more money, and I found EO. And when I found EO, I joined the EO Accelerator Program, and it's the best decision that I ever made. Got introduced to the Rockefeller Habits. The first day of the Accelerator Program, we did a job scorecard, where we score every one of our employees on a scale of zero to 10. My operations manager got a three. Accelerator coach Brandon Ames said, what are you gonna do about it? I said, I'm gonna fire him. Just like that? Just like that. He said, when are you gonna do it? So I'm gonna do it today. He said, well, Whoa, Brandon's a, a cowboy. He said, whoa, buckaroo, you're going to do it today. It's Friday, 3 o'clock. Why don't you sleep on it? Think about it till Monday. I said, no way, brother. I said, you're a coach, and you're going to coach me through this. So he coached me to tell my operations manager I was freeing up his future to do other things, to meet me at the office at Monday at 730, give me your keys. Um, best decision I ever made. Threw myself into the operations of my business, totally reworked everything. Um, over the course of the next two years, we scaled into six different markets across the country, um, and I was able to exit that to a Fortune 100. Yeah, you were bought out. You, yeah. It was a, a nice exit. So what advice would you give someone who is either, A, they're at a million to, to nine million right now, and they're trying to figure out how they can scale. Right now, they're doing well. They may be even making a profit and yet they know that there's something more. What piece of advice would you give them? There's three pieces of advice that I'd give any CEO. So number one, the CEO has to grow at a faster rate than the business. So if you wanna grow at 20 to 50% a year, you personally need to grow at 20 to 50% a year. So what are you reading? What are you listening to? Who's mentoring you? Who's coaching you? Who is making sure that you grow at a faster rate than the business? Because once the business accelerates past you, somebody else has to run the business. Um, number two, I would say build an organization around gratitude and appreciation. So from day one, be grateful to your team, be grateful to your, to your uh, customers, be grateful to your clients, be grateful to the people that, that service you, and think about servicing them first. Um, and have that translate into your home life as well. Run a business of gratitude and appreciation, run a home of gratitude and appreciation. And then finally, the CEO needs to be the chief talent officer. So you need to constantly be recruiting for good people. And even if you're not hiring right now, start building your bench. Ask everybody in your network, who do you know that's extremely talented that I should consider working for my company? Spend 30 minutes a week calling those people, set up one to two appointments a week. And so over the course of a year, talk to 50 to 100 really good people and just be building that bench. Because as you scale, you need to put good people onto your team. And you know the worst thing you can do? Put, it, put an ad on a job board, right? You know who hangs out in job boards? People who are unemployed. Unemployed Or people. those are dissatisfied with their job. Right, yes. so, so do everything you can not to hire from job boards, build your network, and pull from your network when you need to fill a position. Okay, so we have, the acronym is GGR. You need to grow, you need to have gratitude, yeah. and you need to recruit. I love it, okay. I'm gonna use That's that. I remembered it now. Yeah. See, I won't forget it. Yeah. So if you want to grow your business, you need to have GGR, you need to, have, you need to grow yourself, you need to have gratitude, and you need to recruit. And Eric, if someone wants to learn more about, by the way, he, Eric is right now, we're, we're in Atlanta, you can see behind us. He's here, I, we flew our, our entire team here, and we're going through this process that Eric has been talking about in order to grow our people so that we, we can scale 10X and then the 10X again. If someone wants to connect with you, where can they go? We're at petracoach.com, and um, don't think of us as business coaches. We don't coach businesses. We coach human beings, okay? If your business wants to grow 20 to 30% a year, we need to come in and we need to coach everybody on your team to grow 20 to 30% as human beings, and they're gonna take the business with you. If you just focus on the business and you don't focus on the people inside the business, there's gonna be some problems, okay? You gotta grow the people first. Grow your people, 
Now, if you wanna grow your business, get naked, get real, get raw, jump up and down in front of the mirror, and get ready to accelerate your results. This is David Asarno, we'll see you next time.